My topic uh, today is diagnosis and management of intraoperative myocardial ischemia under general anesthesia. The incidence of perioperative cardiac injury is a cumulative result of patients, preoperative medical condition, the specific surgical procedure, the expertise of the surgeon, the diagnostic criteria used to define MI, and the overall medical care provided at a particular institution. The, instu the incidence of perioperative MI is about 5 to 15 percent in elective high risk vascular surgery and it's about 3% in an elective total lip and knee arthroplasty. The clinical predictors of increased perioperative cardiovascular risk include the major uh, predictors are unstable coronary syndromes, acute or recent MI with evidence of ischemic risk, unstable or severe angina, decompen decompensated heart failure, significant dysrhythmias, high-grade AV block, symptomatic ventricular dysrhythmias and supraventricular dysrhythmias with uncontrolled ventricular rate a severe valvular heart disease and intermediate risk factors include uh, mild angina pectoris, previous MMI based on history or Q waves in ECG, compensated or previous heart failure, diabetes mellitus, renal insufficiency. Minor predictors include advanced age more than 70 years, abnormal ECG uh, findings like LVH, LBBB or ST TV abnormalities, rhythm other than normal sinus, uh, low functional capacity, history of stroke and controlled systemic hypertension. Uh, coming to the causes of perioperative MI, uh, the causes include tachycardia more than uh, 110 beats per minute uh, which increases myocardial oxygen consumption, hypotension, hypertension, anemia with a hematocrit of less than 28 percentage, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, hypothermia and systolic and diastolic myocardial dysfunction. Uh, coming to the pathophysiology of uh, peri uh, peri uh, pericardial MI, I mean uh, perioperative MI, uh, it, it can be of two types, perioperative uh, MI can be of acute coronary syndrome or uh, myocardial oxygen demand supply imbalance. The first type occurs as a result of sudden development of a, a thrombotic process associated with vulnerable plaque rupture. Endothelial injury at the site of the plaque rupture triggers the cascade of platelet aggregation, release of mediators and aggregation of platelets and release of mediators potentiates the thrombus formation which leads to the dynamic vasoconstriction leading uh, to vasoconstriction distal to the thrombus so that uh, there will be physical uh, blood vessel narrowing leading to ischemia. The second type occurs due to the increased myocardial oxygen demand in the context of an underlying compromised myocardial oxygen supply. So, uh, the intraoperative events that influence the balance between the myocardial oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption include uh, the conditions which causes decreased oxygen delivery are decreased coronary blood flow, tachycardia, hypotension, hypocapnia which, co uh, which causes coronary vasoconstriction, coronary artery spasm, decreased oxygen content, anemia, arterial hypoxemia and shift of oxygen hemoglobin curve to left and uh, the other causes include increased oxygen requirement in case of uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulation, tachycardia, hypertension, increased myocardial contractility, increased afterload and increased payload. Coming to the diagnosis of uh, perioperative MI, patients uh, under general anesthesia are unable to complain of chest pain. So, uh, but they may present with hypotension, arrhythmias and congestive cardiac failure. So, coming to the ECG findings, uh, patients present with changes of uh, subendocardial and trans, uh, transmural ischemia present with uh, ST elevation of more than 1 mm. Majority of peri uh, perioperative MI is of non-Q wave type preceded by episodes of ST segment depression and T wave inversion. A routine 2 lead ECG detects only 3% of MI, so always a 12 lead ECG will be helpful. A long duration as ST segment change of more than 1 hour is associated with adverse cardiac outcome. The other uh, important is the cardiac biomarkers. The most important and most sensitive cardiac marker is cardiac troponins. The cardiac troponins are tro troponin T and troponin I are rapidly increased into the circulation after a myocyte injury with absolute myocardial tissue specificity and high sensitivity. Cardiac troponins are more sensitive than uh, CKMB. Uh, the cardiac troponins, troponin I uh, starts increasing uh, about uh, 3 to 12 hours and peaks in 24 hours and uh, the uh, duration will be up to 5 to 10 days. Troponin I starts increasing in 3 to 12 hours and peaks in 12, uh, 12 hours to 2 days and duration will be 5 to 14 days. 
CKMB, it is sensitive about 60 to 75 uh, percentage and specificity is about uh, 80 to 95 percentage. The onset is around 3 to 12 hours and peaks in 24 hours and the duration of will be 48 to uh, 72 hours. Other markers will be myoglobin which starts its onset in uh, 1 to 4 hours and peaks in 6 to 7 hours and the duration will be about 24 hours. Other markers are glycoprotein PB, uh, lactic dehydrogenase. Lactic dehydrogenase starts onset in 24 to 48 hours and peaks in uh, 72 hours and it stays in blood about 10, 10 to 14 days. Other markers include uh, AST, CRP, brain arteriotic peptide, myocardial lactate. Uh, BNP, preoperative BNP is an independent predictor of adverse uh, short-term outcome. A cut-off value of 20 to 30 picogram uh, ml for BNP and 125 picogram for ML for NP pro BNP is diagnostic. The most, uh, the next most sensitive uh, thing is the transesophageal echocardiography. Transesophageal echocardiography is required to assess the LV function and any new regional wall motion abnormality for the establishment of definitive diagnosis. Though it may be difficult to distinguish between evolving uh, MI or a stand hibernating myocardium. So T detects any akinesia, severe hypokinesia, or dyskinesia. The other diagnostic uh, parameters are uh, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, an acute increase in the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure due to changes in the left ventricular compliance and the left ventricular hypertrophy is diagnostic. B waves appear in the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is diagnostic of myocardial ischemia. Other uh, systemic pressures which are diagnostic of uh, MI include fall in the arterial pressure and increase in the central venous pressure. Coming to the management, management of perioperative MI uh, includes both prevention and management. So the coming to the prevention strategies, a uh, goals uh, to prevent the perioperative myocardial ischemia is to prevent tachycardia, hypotension, hypoxemia, hypothermia, anemia and myocardial decompensation. A common recommendation is to keep the heart rate and BP within 20% of the normal level value of that patient. So, uh, so pre-op optimization is any beta blockers should not be discontinued in patient at risk of perioperative MI. So, the therapy should be continued even during the surgery. And the statins or uh, uh, the lipid lowering statins are highly effective in the prevention of intraoperative cardiac events. So, uh, statins are also should be continued for non-cardiac non surgery. Uh, coming to the induction and maintenance, uh, uh, the main goal is to prevent tachycardia. So, keeping the duration of direct laryngoscopy less than uh, 15 seconds minimizes circulatory changes. So, blunting the response of uh, laryngotracheal in patient using laryngotracheal lidocaine, IV lidocaine, esmolol, fentanyl, and dexmet can be uh, used. An alpha 2 agonist 300 mics of clonidine 90 minutes before surgery is uh, 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 used to attenuate the hemodynamic response. Use of uh, thoracic epidural to alleviate pain because pain also can lead to tachycardia. So use of volatile anesthetics for uh, preconditioning of the myocardium. Opioids can be used in case of severe LV dysfunction. Muscle relaxant with minimal effect on heart rate should be used. Pancuronium should be avoided because it can lead to increase in heart rate. So my uh, hematocrit should be maintained more than 28% and normothermia should be maintained. So these are the uh, prevention strategies to uh, uh, prevent perioperative MI. Coming to the management of perioperative MI, a patient under GA, uh, as I said before, is unable to complain of pain. So, uh, or, uh, so there should be careful perioperative monitoring and early detection of myocardial ischemia. Additional tests that can be performed are arterial blood gas, open an eye and treat any acid base imbalance if present, uh, correct electrolyte imbalances. The major difference between the perioperative patients and the risk uh, and the normal patients is the risk of life threatening bleeding. So hence thrombolysis cannot be performed and it is contraindicated in perioperative MI. So treatment should be individualized based on the age, comorbidity, life expectancy of the patient, the type of the perioperative and the balance between the death and the risk of bleeding. So if the patient is uh, hemodynamically uh, stable, pharmacological measures can be taken. So uh, the tachycardia should be aggressively treated first. Uh, tachycardia can present with both hypotension and hypotension. If tachycardia is present with hypotension, uh, 
uh, the reason for hypotension should be uh, treated. Uh, so treat hypovolemia with the IV fluid challenge challenge anemia if present should be treated with blood uh, hematocrit target hematocrit should be maintained uh, if the, the hematocrit is less than 25 percent it should be treated with blood in a coronary artery disease patient hematocrit if the hematocrit is less than 30 per percent blood should be administered uh, cut off volatile anesthetics in case of hypotension vasopressors can be used uh, to treat hypotension if tachycardia is present with hypertension, beta blocker therapy can be given. Proponolol at a dose of uh, 0.1 mg per kg and uh, metoprolol uh, 2.5 mg per kg up to 0.5 mg per kg and esmolol 0.5 mg per kg can be given. Other drugs which can be used are calcium channel blockers, uh, nitroglycerin 0.5 to 3 mics per kg per minute and appropriate pain control and opioid supplementation should be given if tachyarrhythmias are present uh, identify the rate and rhythm and uh, treated accordingly uh, perioperative mi can present as both uh, st segment elevation and st segment depression uh, so STEMI uh, occurs due to acute uh, coronary thrombotic occlusion uh, so since the patient is under uh, ga loading dose of aspirin uh, 300 mg and clopilet can be given through the naso nasogastric tube. Uh, so always a STEMI mandates urgent uh, coronary angiogram and, and uh, uh, percutaneous intervention to reduce the mortality rate. Non-ST elevation MI uh, mostly occur due to the myocardial O2 supply demand. So the treatment of uh, extra cardiac causes which lead to O2 supply demand should be, uh, should be considered and treated. So patient, if the patient presents in unstable condition, uh, my uh, perioperative MI is complicated by uh, severe LV dysfunction, which uh, presents as a hemodynamic instability. So hypertension in patients with critical coronary artery stenosis decreases the coronary blood flow, leading to tachycardia, which in turn leads to myocardial oxygen uh, consumption, uh, and thus the vicious cycle continues, leading to the cardiogenic shock. So, rapid aggressive diagnosis and therapeutic approach should be uh, taken, should be in, pa in patients who, who present with he uh, hemodynamic instability. So, immediate coronary angiogram and uh, percutaneous intervention should be given. Uh, patients should be started on dual antiplatelet therapy. Intra-aortic balloon pump is used to increase both myocardial perfusion and cardiac output. Uh, early CABG to provide complete revascularization should be done. So, uh, to conclude, perioperative MI uh, is, uh, is preventable and it should be uh, easily, uh, it should be diagnosed early and treated promptly. Thank you, sir. Very good. Very nice presentation. Very nice. Very nice. But slightly again, as I always find fault with something or other, the question, what is the question? Diagnosis and management of uh, intraoperative MI uh, in patients under general anesthesia. Under general anesthesia. So it is specifically saying intraoperative MI. Of course, what you have said about perioperative MI, uh, overall, that is how most of the books cover this topic. I don't deny that uh, what you have said, or what you have prepared, is that is how the presentation is available in many of the textbooks. So, it is a, a discussion to manage both intraoperative and postoperative when may occurring in a patient who is susceptible for that complication. But if the question specifically says intraoperative and you convert the whole thing into perioperative MI, then you have to write so much about uh, the percutaneous intervention and up to CABG in the postoperative phase. But our concern is mainly in the intraoperative uh, duration. So the first half, what you said is very nice. Uh, whenever you want to identify an intraop MI under GA, as you rightly said, patient is not going to complain of chest pain or have a profuse sweating as you get in a conscious patient who is coming to the ER with all these symptoms, nausea, vomiting. Nothing is going to be there. He is unconscious, he is sedated, he is in analgesic, so he is not going to exhibit any clinical evidence is going to, uh, you, our compliance will be there from the patient. That is the biggest challenge in identifying intraoperative MI. So we are going to identify that condition. First thing based on the possibility of the patient having 
a uh, chance of getting an MI because of his pre-existing cardiac illness. Like he is already a known case of ischemic heart disease patient, or he already is a hyperlipidemic patient, he is already having a family history of myocardial infarction. So such patients are elderly patients. Okay. So first identify the patient who is possibly who is likely to get this problem intraoperatively. So that is the that point is well accepted that you have to first make sure that who are all the potential candidates who can get a intraoperative MI. So in such patients, you should be more careful and vigilant and watchful that it can happen intraoperatively at any time. So that will give, make you uh, be alert and watch the ECG monitor all the time to see whether there are any SC depression or elevation occurring. Okay. So that is the first answer that you have to give. Who are all the patients with pre-existing conditions who are likely to go into that? For example, you take up a patient with 8 grams of hemoglobin for a knee arthroscopy under GA. Surgeon says it is only a diagnostic arthroscopy, sir. There is not likely to be much of blood loss. We will just take up, he is a 50, 60 year old fellow. Uh, we just want to do his arthroscopy. He is having severe pain. If at all, I'm just going to give a wash and come out. That's all the procedure. So you think it is a very least harmful procedure and you accept the patient and you give GA because he refuses to have a regional for that. And intraoperatively, there is a sudden hypotension. Okay. So the preoperative anemia could have aggravated this problem also. So all these things you have to think in mind that the preoperative causes which can lead to intraoperative anemia that you have to enumerate. <clears throat> then coming to the intraoperative problem, you have to identify only by the hemodynamic changes that happen because patient is not going to complain of any pain as I said earlier. So the hemodynamic changes again may not be very specific for this condition alone. There are other reasons where a patient can become hypotensive, can become tachycardic or bradycardic depending upon the condition. So the only uh, clue for us is the enzymes, biomarkers. But they are also going to raise only after three hours. So if the surgery is going to be long enough to undergo uh, for three hours or four hours and you find a raise in biomarkers, then you are sure that it has, some cardiac event has occurred and you can diagnose that intraoperative MI has occurred. But uh, if the surgery gets uh, finished within the uh, three hours time, then you are going to not going to get a clue. So in that case, what is the answer for this? How are you going to diagnose and is that? So seeing the ECG changes, uh, okay. the operative ECG and the okay. in intraoperative ECG changes. changes. Uh, so ECG changes you can expect. Definitely that will be a good clue yeah. to diagnose. Which you said two things, subendocardial and transmural ischemia. Which particular lead will definitely tell you about distinguish between subendocardial and transmural ischemia? That is lead placement, I am asked. ECG, normally we, do you want a 5 lead ECG or a 3 lead ECG? 12 well, lead ECG is more uh, diagnostic. 12 well, lead ECG, we normally place 5 leads and we get all the 12 leads. Uh, one. In yes, drop, you don't uh, even place 3 sometimes. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> uh, both either volume may cannot be diagnosed. Have you heard of CM5 configuration? No, sir. Hmm? No, sir. CM5 configuration. Have you heard of that? No, sir. How do you place the leads for a CM5? Are you there? Ammo? Can anyone answer that? CM5 configuration to protect subendocardial ischemia. Normally, if you put a three uh, right, huh? right arm uh, Very good. Uh. Left arm electrode on V uh, V five and uh, shoulder left shoulder. Yeah. So shifting the right arm 
lead to the central mandibular. That's why it's called CM5 configuration. Okay. So the left arm lead is put in the fifth position. When you take ECG for anterior chest wall leads, V1, V2, V3, V1 we put on the right side of the sternum. Then V2, we put it on the left border of the sternum and then one centimeter apart, we go up to V5. So you put the left arm lead in the V5 position, right arm lead in the central mandibulum sternum and the left leg position in the normal downward position. Then it is called the CM5 configuration, which is supposed to be the best lead for identifying subendocardial ischemia when ST depression or elevation is happening. All the other things will tell you about the transmural only. If you put it in the normal L, L2 or V5 configuration, it will tell only about the neural. So, CM5 is supposed to be the best indicator about sub endocardial ischemia also. So, ECG can give you a very good clue. And if with the ECG changes, if it is associated with the hemodynamic instability, then you can definitely suspect. Yeah, you cannot 100% diagnose that it is a myocardial ischemia, but it should trigger the suspicion in you and you should try to. And for such patients who are at risk with a known history of ischemic heart disease or coronary heart disease, a basal biomarker study, that is preoperative level of uh, troponin. And if you do that, even within two hours or one and a half hours intraoperatively, if there is a 20% rise from the basal level, then it is definitely an indication that there is an ischemic injury. We need not go to the normal classical diagnostic level. Even if there is a 20% increase from the basal level, then you can diagnose intraoperative ischemia. Okay? And second challenge in this case, you have diagnosed is intraoperative ischemia. Your first aim is to stabilize the patient. If he is hemodynamically stable, well and good, no problem. But if he is hemodynamically unstable, now comes the question whether to thrombolyze him, whether to prevent a clot for proceeding further, or to treat him conservatively. That is the biggest challenge in the management. So cases where you don't, you are not likely to have a bleed, like the example I gave you, an arthroscopic surgery, even if you give thrombolysis, you are not going to cause any major bleeding there. Whereas if it is a neurosurgery or a <coughs> intraoperative laparotomy or a vascular procedure, then definitely you cannot do any thrombolysis. So there the concern is to see whether you can abort the surgery and close it and take him up for resuscitation and restore the blood supply to the myocardium as quickly as possible. If that is not possible, go for all the supporting measures. As you said, you go for AADB and other measures to support the patient and try to <clears throat> re-establish the coronary perfusion as much as possible with correction of anemia, prevention of hypothermia, all the risk factors, the intraoperative risk factors you avoid and then try to salvage the patient as much as possible. And uh, of course, if it is asked what are all the, <clears throat> how do you diagnose and manage perioperative ischemia, then you have prepared an excellent answer for that. That will be the best way to write it in the time allotted for you. It is a very good preparation. But if it is just intraop ischemia, then I don't think uh, writing about perioperative going up to the post-op will be needed. Because you can just manage with the challenges that you face intraoperatively by mentioning the trouble that you are having in diagnosis as well as you know, the dilemma and the management whether to proceed with uh, thrombolysis or just uh, for that matter even a uh, uh, PCI. That challenge has to be discussed. That's what I feel. Any questions on that? Do you have any? <clears throat> Alternate answer, some more. Jay Bardi or Peshwar Rao. Whoever wants to contradict my question and say something, or Dr. Vasanti, agree with me or not. I think, I think, I think everything was covered. Um, the troponin levels are. Uh, 
more important. I think that she must stress on that. Um, yes, yes. And then, uh, and then interoperative. There are some articles which I read, which uh, said that um, actually it was a case presentation in one of these articles which I presented. That patient went in for a severe cardiogenic shock during the interoperative period for uh, liver resection, then went on to ECMO. And while he was on ECMO, he recovered and he became better. And um, then he came out of it. And they did the uh, after CABG, they did the uh, resection also because it was a cholangiocarcinoma uh, of the liver. They did the resection, and then um, and then of course he died, I believe, after about uh, 15 days. But uh, they went through the whole um, uh, procedure. So intraop MI is very very important to uh, first of all to prevent. And secondly, to recognize very early and intervene early. That is something which we need to also understand. So these are the three aspects of that, of intraoperative MI. And there's a very high chance that the patient will survive because we are uh, we are there to diagnose it. So that is an important thing. It's like yeah, an intra, um, uh, like a witness cardiac arrest. Yeah. I'll just uh, go through that and we will finish the class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So here also, as I Dr. Jaibati started, most of the textbooks give the uh, uh, presentation only as perioperative myocardial infarction. If the question is uh, intraoperative myocardial infarction, you can just take it as part of it, but definitely it can happen both intra and post-op. So that is how most of the books define this. So defining periodic MI, MI is difficult because most uh, MI occur without symptoms in anesthetized or sedated patients. That is the first challenge. ECG changes are not always very uh, persistent. They can be subtle or transient. And earlier they were depending on creatinine kinase, which uh, uh, got released very early, but now it is the specificity for this is lost because this is released from other muscle injuries also, apart from cardiac. So nobody now believes in CKMB. And the majority of patients will have elevation of troponin within two to three hours onset. So if the surgery gets prolonged or if the MA happens after three hours of start and you send the troponin and you get a positive result, that is 100% confirmation there is a myocardial injury. But if the surgery gets over or it is shorter duration and you don't get a positive response to troponin, you must have a high degree of suspicion. That is what I want to insist on. So cardiac troponin has shown to be exclusive to cardiac muscle. In the pathophysiology, there are two types. As she rightly mentioned, acute coronary syndrome, type 1 and type 2. In type 1, you have the uh, 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 ACS where the plaque ruptures and there is a thrombus formation at the site of the plaque rupture. That is called type 1 myocardial ischemia or infarction. In type 2, there is a prolonged myocardial oxygen supply and demand. And this happens mainly in patients who have a stable coronary artery disease. So their plaque is much more stable. And it is because of the imbalance between the supply, because inadequate analgesia, causing tachycardia, shorter duration of diastole, then this stable coronary cardiac patients also can go in for myocardial infarction. So these are the two types which we have to distinguish. Because in stable coronary artery disease, what you need to do is reduce the heart rate, increase the oxygen supply, so things will settle down. Whereas in acute coronary syndrome, you definitely need to thrombolyze or do a PCI. This basic point, if we understand, we will not be able to mismanage the patient. That is the main important thing. So this distinction is key to therapeutic consideration. So acute coronary syndrome or type 1 PMI occurs when unstable or vulnerable block undergoes spontaneous rupture, fissuring as is occurring in, with a coronary thrombosis, ischemia and infarction. 
So serial troponin level are very very important. So even if it is absent or not very much raised during the first two hours, you have to do a serial estimation after four hours, six hours. Then you will get a positive response. So nowadays, uh, any patient coming with a chest pain to the ER, if uh, the first uh, troponin is uh, negative, they don't immediately send the patient out if there is a classical clinical symptom of subternal pain, sweating, and uh, audio vomiting. They do a serial analysis, and six hours later, if the troponin is still negative, then only they admit that it cannot be a personal event. So, serial estimations are very much indicated. Now, the second thing is unstable coronary plus. These are all the how, how the whole thing, what I said is this is called acute uh, <coughs> disease type 1 and type 2, which is described in the uh, flow chart pattern. And when they come for non cardiac surgery, the baseline risk has to be assessed. And you have to take the intraoperative factors into consideration. The baseline risk for what is the nature of the surgical trauma, what is the platelet activation likely, how much is coagulation activation, catecholamine, cortical surge, bleeding or fluid shifts. So these intraoperative events, what are all the things that are likely to happen, we have to take into consideration. And if the patient has got a atherosclerotic coronary plaque disruption, then we will go for this definitely with the chances of develop, developing a myocardial injury is there. Similarly, if the patient is a hypertensive, they are, he may develop intraoperatively hyper, hypotachybrady, hypoxemia, anemia, all these things he mentioned, which are likely to aggravate this, and they also can contribute to the uh, uh, myocardial infarction during non cardiac surgery. So, the diagnosis of uh, acute myocardial syndrome is mainly by ECG abnormalities and the Hemodynamic status, tachycardia or hemodynamic instability or severe pulmonary edema like the chest with congestion, the reduction in saturation, decrease in lung compliance, and these. So these things will give you a clue that the left ventricle is failing and back pressure is increasing and there is a uh, acute failure. So these things only you have to indirectly make a diagnosis. And uh, the ECG criteria, of course, the ST elevation at J point more than one millimeter, depending on the location, and ST depression 0.5 T wave inversion at least in one week. So this is how how the this is the basic physiology of action potential and how the ST segment is formed and how it all vary. There are different types of ST segment changes. Uh, this is called upsloping, this is downsloping, and this is horizontal. So that is why it becomes difficult. It can produce um, in, uh, exhibit in different forms. So we have to know all these various forms which uh, produce these changes. And uh, in acute MA, the myocardial cell death occurs due to prolonged myocardial ischemia and it is diagnosed by the troponin levels or biomarker. And uh, there are symptoms of ischemia in a conscious patient, but in an uh, anesthetized patient, you don't get any of those things. And new segment ST or T wave changes, or a new LBB also is an indicator of myocardial ischemia. And new pathological Q waves, and the imagining <coughs> evidence of new loss of viable myocardium or regional wall motion abnormality. If, as we mentioned, if you have a uh, but possibility of doing a transthoracic or a transesophageal echo, definitely you can find out the regional wall motion normality. Or an intracoronary thrombus by angiography or autopsy, where the method earlier it was done and uh, suggestive of. So, this is how they identified in the olden days. After death, they used to do an angiography or an autopsy and find out that patient has died of MA if, uh, if there is a litigation. But otherwise, you have to just presume and uh, make a diagnosis that the patient would have died of MI. And the management confirmed diagnosis with a 12 ED CG, considered transgenial or transthoracic echo if the patient is hemodynamic instability is detected. Obtain baseline and four hour troponin levels. These are all the methods of confirmation of myocardial ischemia. Then the treatment is optimize myocardial oxygen supply demand. And 
fast surgery is appropriate anyway if the surgery is not a very life threatening or urgent surgery and if it can be aborted at any stage without any difficulty then first the choice is to stop the surgery <coughs> physiological goals as mentioned earlier low or normal heart rate normal blood pressure normal oxygen saturation and with the least fio2 possible avoid hypothermia and avoid excess fluid load then administer medicines beta blockers to achieve low or normal heart rate and no hypotension considering giving aspirin and uh, ntg infusion consider the use of intrahepatic balloon pump as guided by cardiologist Now here one question to the JBRT is, what about patients who are not on beta blocker therapy earlier? Can you start them on beta blocker prophylactically before surgery if they have features of ischemic heart disease like occasional chest pain? Adrenaline can be do you know in at risk. Now, many vascular surgeons have the habit of starting beta blocker just two days or three days before vascular surgery. After reading some literature okay. saying that beta blockers have a protective effect on perioperative myocardial infarction, that should not be done. So, if you want to start beta blocker before any vascular surgical procedure, or for that matter, any major procedure in a patient with a risk of my uh, intraop or perioperative myocardial infarction. it should be started at least 10 days prior to the surgery so that the patient will uh, get used to the drug and then he will be able to uh, adjust to the uh, the body gets adjust to that otherwise within one or two days of administration of beta blocker if you take up the patient they are likely to get uh, severe hypotension or i mean bradycardia from which it may be difficult to treat so wait for about a week or 10 days for the drug to establish its action and you know what will be the basal heart rate then you can take up the patient otherwise it may cause more harm and the second thing is uh, starting beta blocker has not proved to be completely effective uh, in preventing complication many patients who have not developed fma they die of stroke so cerebral complications occur in patients who have been started on recently started on beta blocker to avoid myocardial complications they instead develop cerebral complications like stroke and die so we know or starting mm. beta blocker just close to the time of surgery is not at all recommended it should be started at least 10 days prior to the surgery the same thing holds good for statins also Okay, please remember the point and uh, consider abandoning the surgery and uh, <clears throat> the situation specific. How unstable is the patient? How urgent is the surgery? Can surgery stop rapidly if the patient deteriorates? And if surgery is con continued, having an experienced surgeon to complete the surgery as quickly as possible. Until cardiologist, it's all to be written in management also. So the answer for managing the drop or three of them is these all the points also to be included. So if evidence of SVMA is present on ECG and there is hemodynamic instability, emergent cardiology opinion is considered to check the need for PCI. And thrombolysis is contraindicated. Surgical incision has been made even in minimally invasive surgeries, and uh, except in minimally invasive surgeries. So uh, the arthroscopy, when you diagnose MI, there is no contraindication to give him a thrombolytic agent. And post-operative con con consideration, post-operative management will be <coughs> patient-specific, which include post-operative placement, consider more intensive monitoring, and need for telemetry, consider need for serial ECGs and troponins, depending on the index of suspicion, ensure cardiology follow. or in patient review if in fact is suspected ensure good analgesia euvolemia and addition of beta blockers uh, that is this all can be even small uh, quick acting or a short duration beta blockers to if the tachycardia is very severe and uh, maintain normal oxygen saturation with judicious oxygen therapy this is being repeatedly emphasized 
that don't give 100% oxygen for too long. So that is the reason thinking in management of myocardial infarction. Just give judicious oxygen therapy or the minimum with which you can maintain a photo saturation of more than 95 is sufficient. And the Cummins aspirin and uh, other uh, antiplatelet agents, depending on cardiology opinion. So mm -hmm. these are all the monitors that can be used electrocardiography, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and echocardiography. If these three are available, Diagnosis of intraoperative MI is very, very easy. If uh, these two especially are available, you can easily diagnose. And this is a flow chart what you do about uh, patients with hemodynamic instability and patients who are hemodynamically stable, trying to identify the condition and then try to decide on the therapy. So, okay. So did she mention did she mention transesophageal echo sir because yeah, yeah. in between my inventor oh, okay sir. yeah yeah she mentioned that okay sir. Right. like one of the methods of identifying or detecting diagnosis she mentioned transesophageal where you will see a new regional wall motion she specifically mentioned that also okay like any questions or any doubts? Dr. Kamachi there? Audible? You are audible, sir, but nobody else needs to be answering, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then we'll close. Thank you, Vasanti. Okay, sir. Thank okay, you. sir. Thank you, sir.